Hi. The subject I was given for my talk today was how to tell a great story. I was also given 10 minutes. So I'm just a small Jewish girl from the tip of Africa. Let's not kid. I'm not Charles Dickens. And even if I was, I doubt that I could give you a formula for how to tell a great story in 10 minutes, which is why I thought it would be more realistic for me to give you a few of the little things I've developed over the last 10 years that have helped me in my own aspirations to tell great stories. I think we all remember the weird-looking, peculiar girl from school who had fuzzy hair and wore awful clothes, and she had ADHD and dyslexia and remedial problems, and you knew that if you sat next to her, you too would have been branded as a freak, and you would have been ostracized accordingly. So I was that girl, and if you didn't sit next to me, it's okay. <laughs> because I developed my own friend. I had an imaginary friend called Tanya, and she was way cooler than any of you could have been. Tanya lived in an imaginary house, this huge epic mansion, not unlike the house that Mrs. Havisham lived in in Great Expectations. And she had this fantastic mother who was constantly getting married. So by the time I was eight, I had attended so many wedding feasts, and I had been a bridesmaid, a flower girl, a best man, a pole holder. Um, I'd done the entire fucking retinue. And what I learned from that is that life can be a bitch. It'll give you a lot of reasons you need to escape. But sometimes, with imagination and with storytelling, we find ways of escaping. One of the side effects of having dyslexia was that when my friends were all getting lost in the adventures of Nancy Drew, I was just learning to clumsily identify, look, John, Rover catches ball. But I was rescued from what would have been an intellectually barren childhood by growing up in a family where my mother was a drama teacher. So, from when I was literally a toddler, I was surrounded by people who were performing Shakespeare and reciting Dickens and Greek mythology. And this gave me a great literary foundation. Now, I'm not the girl who was born to be a writer. I'm the girl who failed and who bunked school and who got expelled and eventually flunked out without getting a matric. It wasn't until I was in my mid-30s that I picked up a pen. But that literary foundation has held me as a writer. And it gave me a very firm belief that if you want to write great stories, you have to read great stories. If you read trash, you will write trash. Now, far be it for me to knock trash. I think the dame who wrote Fifty Shades of Grey is smiling today. <laughs> When the two roads diverged, who's to say I took the higher road? She's wearing a fuckload more Chanel than I am today. <laughs> but if your choice is to write great stories, you have to read the great stories. Every time I start a new book, I go back and read great, The Great Gatsby, partially to remind myself that I'm seriously a big schmuck, and partially to remind myself what there is to aspire to. Um, as I, growing up, as I was inadvertently, unconsciously ingesting Shakespeare, so too, now, my children growing up are inadvertently, unconsciously ingesting the fucking Kardashians. And that's something we've got to realize. None of us are aware of how much shit is out there and constantly coming at us. <laughs> um, so you've got to seek out the good stuff. Um, another thing I feel very strongly about is truth. I always say I write 
on the other side of procrastination. I write the colors of my memory. I write to witness what I've seen. I write because I have no choice. I write because I think I'm stupid and I want to prove I'm not stupid. I write because no one understood me as a child. I write because I want to avenge the dead. I write my ghosts. I write to start a revolution. I write for the man I love. There's always a different day that we write for different reasons. But I always say, unwritten characters go feral inside your head. And I've known a lot of characters who were safer, tucked away in the books of bookstores and bookshelves than they were rattling unsupervised inside my brain. But it's not the characters who are the most dramatic or the most comic or the most tragic and glamorous who live on inside our hearts. It's the characters written with the most truth. Recently, I was mentoring a young girl who wanted to write her memoir. And she kept getting tripped up on her father and his bathrobe. She said, was it knee length or calf length? Was it green, was it blue? Did he tie the sash clockwise or anti-clockwise? And I got a funny feeling and I said to her, sweetheart, did your father come into your room at night? And when he did, was he actually wearing a bathrobe? And there was a long pause, and she said, my father's bathrobe was made out of terry cloth. Now at that moment, we both knew I could no longer mentor her because she wasn't ready to write a memoir. And if she had, the reader would have felt cheated. Because we misunderstand, writing may be therapeutic, but it's not therapy. One thing you owe your reader is the truth. And that applies as much when you're selling a packet of, of crisps as it does when you're writing a memoir. Carve your plot out. Write into your character, don't write your character. Show the story, don't tell your story. All of this is important. But as with life, if you're not going to pitch up on the page with truth, don't bother pitching up. This is a job that will underpay you. It will publicly humiliate you. It will intellectually impoverish you. But if there's one thing that takes you down in the end, it is the constant demand for integrity. I have a friend who's an international bestseller. She's got no reason to bitch. But recently I was talking to her and I said, you know, I was a good waitress. I earned reasonable money as a waitress. I was respected by my peers. I kept good hours and there were great side effects. I got good money, good food. It, it was a reasonable job. Why did I give it up for this shit? Why do we do this? There must be something better we can do. And she said, yeah. We could be lifesavers in a sewage tank. Anything is better than this. Um, but the one thing that I will say is if we want to tell great stories, we need to come out in the open. Um, in real life, everybody here, more than anywhere else in the world, knows the influencers are the people with 50 trillion Twitter followers. I know, because I've got three. <laughs> Um, but in art, the influencers are the painters and the writers and the musicians and filmmakers who capture our hearts and reel us in with great stories. And they do that by telling us stories about real people. It's not people you find on the internet. It's the eye contact you get with the man who sells you homeless chalk on the side of the road. It's the conversation you have with the lady who packs your groceries at the checkout counter. It's the woman sitting in the corner over there who's 96% in the room, but there's 4% that I suspect is hankering after something outside. And it's in that 4% that there might be a great story. We're losing that as a species. We're losing our connection with one another. We don't talk, we text. We don't meet over Facebook. We, meet, we don't meet over dinner, we meet over Facebook. We're losing one another. And at, with that, we will lose our stories. So I'm standing here 
one short girl with a very short bio and very little credibility. But I, if I can give you anything, it's that I think it's possible to find escape. We need to seek out the great literature. We need to tell the truth. And ironically, I think we need to disconnect from digital. Thank you. Thank you.